Hello, everyone. Welcome to Virtual VSC. My name is Kristen. I am the Visual Arts Program Manager here at Vermont Studio Center. If you are unfamiliar with um, who or what VSC is, we are a year-round residency for artists and writers located in Northern Vermont. All right, so Rob Hitzig. Rob is a self-taught artist who studied geology and history as an undergraduate in environmental sciences in graduate school. He has spent three years working as a forester, agroforester in West Africa with the Peace Corps before joining the US Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, DC to work on soil and groundwater hazardous waste contamination issues. His art career developed out of a furniture making hobby he nurtured while living in DC. As his skills advanced, he found he was more interested in making art with wood than in making functional pieces. Eventually, he decided to quit his job so that he could move to Vermont and explore his aesthetic vision full time. His work has evolved into two distinct forms, indoor paintings and a painted sculpture practice that demonstrates an, an obsession with visual texture and a public art practice that focuses on creating an experience of joy and inclusion. In both, however, his work evokes visual questions. He believes art is an indispensable tool for opening minds by helping people to question habitual thinking patterns. In this way, he hopes his art can be a benefit to society. His work is on view right now in the Red Mill Gallery at Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Vermont. Um, and it is up until August 13th. Without further ado, Rob, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Kristen. Really appreciate it. It's great. And thank you everybody for joining me. It's great to see you. Um, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, basically just talk about the show, the, the title of the show, where that came about, um, give an overview of walk through images, the overview of the, the gallery space and how the, how the work looks in the show, and then walk through each of the individual pieces and talk about them individually. And people are free to raise questions as I go through them because it might make sense to, rather than going waiting to the end to talk about pieces I've talked about previously, just raise your hand or ask a question right out as I'm talking. So I'll share my screen here. Okay. Um, well, the title, Patience and Perseverance, there's two aspects to that. Um, in one respect, it's because some of the, the, as the pandemic came about, I decided that I didn't want to create new work and put it in storage because it looked as if there wouldn't be any good opportunities for art sales this last year. So what I decided to do is go into my storage space and look at work that I was never really satisfied with or that I had never finished and pull those out and work on them for the year rather than creating new work that would just be added to my storage space. Um, and some of these pieces were up to 14 years old. So I had started a few of them, a couple of them in 2007. Um, there's some that are only a couple years old, but everything is anywhere from 14 to two years old in terms of the amount of work. And then a number of them have been reworked a number of times. So the whole process of creating this show is a, a, a time, a, a massive time endeavor. Um, but there's also another aspect to it in, in, the, in that my work takes a lot, a lot of time um, in, in good circumstances, even if I know what I'm doing and I, I go straight through a piece, start to finish on a piece and like what's, what's done at the end, it'll still take um, weeks or months to, to finish a piece. I'm not the type of person that will crank out a piece in hours or days. It's, 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 a, it's a long process. And a lot of that goes back to where my art originated from in that I learned, I started making art uh, after having learned how to make furniture, it evolved out of my furniture making practice. Practice, And one of the things that I, I loved about, one of the aspects of the furniture making process that I really latched onto was the finishing technique of uh, French polish in which you use shellac 
to layer on um, the finish. And you could create a really deep, beautiful, vibrant um, a tone to the, the finish. It's, 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 shellac is a natural substance and it's, it creates a finish that's unlike anything else if you use this rubbing technique called French polish. So um, that technique takes a, a while to develop and it's not really even that that process alone takes quite a while. So under good under good circumstances, my work will take quite a while to do. But um, because of the pandemic, I've some of these pieces in the show are up to fourteen years old. So that's that's the aspect of the title. Um, so let me just walk through the show with you, and um, I'll talk about these pieces individually. This is a diptych in the corner. Um, another piece right here. Uh, and then this is a triptych, a big triptych about seven feet wide. This is a diptych. Um, and then you go to the other side of the gallery. Great lighting in this gallery, by the way. It's a really beautiful front window. Uh, and then this piece here, a single, and this is a, well, we call it a triptych, but it is three pieces. And then this piece in the corner is actually four separate pieces. And it's hard to tell, but they, yeah. I'll talk about that later. Um, and then this piece on the far wall is about six and a half feet wide. Okay. And then, okay, we'll start with this one. So these, this is actually two pieces. So these both were started in 2007 and they come from the same board. What I did is I put it through a bandsaw and opened it up like a book. So I, I created two book match pieces that are matching. And a lot of my previous work, what I did is I book match pieces and glued them together. But with these, I kept them separate and carved it out according to the grain pattern. Um, but it was after I finished doing that, I was stuck. I didn't know how to. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know, didn't know how to display it. Um, I let me go back. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know whether it would, would be a two-sided piece. I, I I thought it'd be interesting to have it somehow shown on two sides. Um, and if it was on a wall, how would I hang it on a wall so that it would create a shadow? It, it, there's just very light, delicate pieces. And I was just stuck. So they literally stood in my studio from 2007 till about 2019. I had on two different occasions, some friends came by and were wandering through my studio and they looked at these pieces that were totally unfinished, just lying there against the wall. And they're like, these are great. You got, you got to do something with them. Um, finish them. I was like, uh, yeah, but I don't know how to hang them. <laughs> so um, a, a little over a year later, I was at the Armory Show in New York, uh, just before the pandemic actually, it was early March, 2020. And I saw some pieces that were hung on these offset pleats that you know they came out from the wall and they were metal and they they it, was, it looked like a, a really good technique for hanging something about an inch off the wall. Um, but these pieces are only half inch thick, so attaching the cleat to it isn't that easy. But that's what I want. I decided to do, and. What I ended up having to do is mortising in the hold, the hold for the cleat. So instead of screwing it in, it's, it, there's really there's not enough room there to screw anything on. So I mortised in the back. And um, anyway, the point is that I finally, in March of 2020, finally figured out how I was going to hang them. So I got around to then going back and finishing them with um, tinted shellac. So this is a French polish technique to, and you really can't see the quality of the finish, but it is very nice. But um, what I used here 
is tinted shellac to get that color. It's, this is a piece of bird's eye maple and you can see some of the bird's eye here, but um, the color comes from a tint that I add to shellac and then I paint on and then polish. So this is mostly a red and a, a yellow. I don't think I use blue. The other one, let me see, get back to that one. This one, I use that primarily red and blue on them. So they're complementary pieces. And again, you can see it's a bird's eye maple. Um, the amazing thing I thought about these though, you know, for 14 years, they're my studio and <laughs> these, these feet are so delicate. I was, I was amazed they never broke. <laughs> I would, I would always look at it and like, you know, it's amazing. It never broke <laughs> for years and years. But um, so now they have, they're, they're safely on a wall, I, I guess, hopefully. And that, that was another thing I was thinking originally. I was thinking that I would lean them against the wall, that they wouldn't be hung. They would just be a leaning piece, but that they're really too delicate to do that with. So um, this hanging system is a much better idea, I think, safer. Um, but I also like that they're inch off the wall so that these holes will create shadows in the back. Anyway, they're complementary. And the titles, what I do, a lot of my work, I don't like to create titles that are descriptive. A lot of times I'll, I want to, um, I, I, I think an abstract title is a good way to go with abstract art. Um, so a lot of times I'll make up names or words. Um, but with these pieces, I see them as individuals. I don't see them as uh, art per se. I see them as, uh, I hate to say people, but beings, so some kind of being, they're, they're alive. They, they, they seem alive to me. They seem like they have a, uh, they're, there's a live, I don't know. And um, so I gave them names. This, um, I think this one's, I'm not sure which one's which, but one is Obene and the other is Ibene. Ibene. So they're, those are their names. And I think they're six, they're six, yeah, they're almost 70 inches tall. So they're pretty, pretty large, pretty high, but only five inches wide. Oh, so number two, this is Lagovillain, Lagovillain, um, which is actually a reference to Scotch. And the only reason, the reason for that is because the piece was originally cut and shaped in 2009, but I didn't finish it until 2021. So 12 years, I was thinking 12 years, that sounds like a good scotch. We won't name it after the scotch. <laughs> anyway, um, but the history of this piece is that it was actually my neighbor's tree that he cut down in 2009. And I thought it might make it for interesting art. So I bought it off of him for 40 bucks. So then I spent another 40 bucks to find somebody to cut it up into boards for me or pieces. And uh, this is, I've, I've made my canoe seats out of this wood and I've made three pieces of art and I still have a, another good sizable chunk of art left. I mean, wood left to work with. Um, and this one, I, so it was cut in 2009 and I had to wait a good five years for it to dry because it was just air drying. I didn't get a kiln dried. Um, so I don't think I started working on it until 2015 or 16. And I painted it in once back in 2000, years ago, I don't know when. Um, I didn't like it. I painted it another way, I didn't like it. I think I painted it a third way. I didn't like it. Um, and then I was debating what to do with it. I was considering throwing it away, giving up on it. I don't know. Um, but what I ended up doing this last year is cleaning it up again, taking all the old paint off and just outlining the, the features of the piece. So this line goes, wraps all the way around this piece. Um, because I eat, 
it's just such a beautiful piece of wood. I, I just didn't want to interfere with any of these, these markings. This is, this is all rotted wood here that I cleaned up and filled with shellac. Um, so it's all stabilized. And there's a really beautiful crack here. And this is a net, I didn't shape this at all. That was a natural triangle cut here. And um, the paint wraps all the way around the bottom too. And there's a nice knot on the bottom that it wraps around. So I guess after about four tries, I finally came up with a painting system that highlights the features of the wood without interfering with it. So that's perseverance for you, I guess. That's the title. Um, and then this piece is a triptych. Uh, it's about seven feet wide. It's called um, Basati and another made up name. Um, the history of this piece is that uh, I was working with a gallery who wanted me to make a big piece for their window because they have a really nice display space and window facing the street. And I was asked to make something that was about seven feet wide, but in three pieces so that the gallery could transport it if it sold to the any buyer, it would be easy to move. Um, but about a month after this conversation and after I bought the wood and I cut, I mean, bought the, this is made on plywood. So I bought the plywood, I cut it to shape. About a month after we had, they had the conversation and everything was, I was ready to go, um, I was told that the gallery was closing and they wouldn't need the piece. So it, I just put it aside, let it sit there uh, and didn't work on it for well over a year. Um, but this is actually a pre-pandemic pre pre piece in that uh, I pulled it out at the beginning of the year and decided, well, I was, cause I was really ambitious at the beginning of 2020. I thought it was gonna be a great year and I needed a really great piece for the, the year. So I, I was ambitious and I started working on it. And um, I finished it right before everything got locked down. So this was May of, May of I mean, March of, of 2020 that I, I finished it. Um, and anyway, this I'm just zooming in here to show you the layers. This is acrylic paint on top, but underneath it's a mix of Tinted shellac, shellac, acrylic paint running, um, spray paint, graphite, yeah, graphite, um, gesso, oh, just a lot of things. It's just, uh, I like the idea of creating mystery underneath the paint so that there's something to like draw you in closer and make you want to look at the, the depth. And that's the great thing about working with shellac too is it allows you to create depth on a two-dimensional two surface. And also by, run, by rubbing and polishing this piece, you, you get things that come through the paint. You can actually see through in some places, um, like right here. This is all, it's, it's, you, get, you can get it so thin that the paint is, is transparent right here. It's right, yeah. I, I find that very interesting. It's one of the reasons I love working with the, pro, the shellac and, and the process that I use. Um, what else can I tell you about this piece? It's a made up name. And uh, yeah, there you go. And then this piece called Potu, which actually is not a made up name. It's actually a reference to something, I'll, I'll get to it. But um, this one was started in 2015. And originally these boards were, were made to, there's a two-sided piece that was made to be perpendicular to a wall. So, and these are about six inches wide. So it came out quite a bit from the wall and they're just, it's a the piece itself is about six inches, six feet high, six feet long, no, five feet, but still it, it's, it's substantial and it just never worked the way I originally envisioned. 
Um, so I put it aside and thought that I, my, I would never really have a good use for it. Um, but uh, so at sometime during this pandemic year, I pulled it out and looked at it again and decided, well, instead of two individual pieces, these would work really well together as a diptych. So I cleaned it up some more. Some of the painting wasn't very good with it either. Some of the colors are bad. So I, I painted over some of the colors and added some other colors and um, then attached them together. And you can't really see, but there's, there's like three attachments between here. And it's painted on flame birch. This is a, a really, really nice piece of flame birch. That you see the waves the curl in it. Um, and when I was thinking of a title for the piece, I was just thinking of how it reminded me of ocean waves. And when I started thinking about ocean waves, I was thinking about um, this village on the coast of Senegal that I, I know of. And, um, and the, the northern coast of Senegal is, is just, it's a really violent, wavy area. I mean, you really can't swim in the, the ocean. It's, it's, it's too rough. But um, these way, these curls in the wood reminded me of that. So that's why I named it Hutu. Hutu. And um, well, there you go. We'll move to the next one. So this piece is called Sententen, Sententen. And it was made in 2000, it was originally created in 2007 as the first two pieces I talked about were um, the same time period. It was, a, it was a transition period between one series and another. And so this is what I was doing for maybe a year when I was transitioning. And it was originally hanging vertically and I did actually hang it and I did actually had tinted shellac to it. So it was finished, but it was never really good. And it really wasn't, wasn't working the way I had done it. And so it was sitting in my storage at home for many years. And then I brought it to my studio and I thought I'd rework it, but I never knew how or what to do with it. So it sat in my studio for another few years. And um, as I was going through everything else, I thought I'd work on it again. What I did is I added more color to it. So I, I wanted to create um, more of a rainbow effect, have different colors, but make it subtle enough that it looked like it might be an actual animal of some kind, an actual life form. Um, and then I, I, as with those first two pieces I talked about, I, I created offset cleats so it would hang um, in the middle, it's an inch off the wall, but it's a bent piece. Um, so at the edges, it's about five, five or six inches off the wall. And um, you know, this this way of hanging it really works well for shadows. You get really nice shadows between and the holes on the, the bottom as well. Um, and by the way, most all of these images were taken by. Uh, Rick Levinson at RL Photo and uh, RL Photo Studio in Burlington, so that's why the pictures look good. Um, he does a really great job. This is a really nice photo. I, I I could do some photography, but that's not great. And the bigger pieces are impossible for me to do. I just there's just no good way to get the lighting on it. So um, yeah, you can see this is carved on it on the this edge, uh, and it's this is a maple. I don't really, wouldn't really call it bird's eye maple, but it's an almost bird's eye maple. Is that a word? As a, <laughs> I don't know if that, that's unofficial. I don't think anybody calls anything an almost bird's eye maple. But I, there you go. That's set tenton. I don't know where the name came from. And then this piece is made of three 
three boards that come from the same plank. So I had one plank that was maybe 12 feet long. At least, yeah, it might've been 12 feet long, I don't know. Um, and it was probably an inch and a half thick. So it was a big sizable board. And I started this piece in 2009. Um, I started it almost immediately after seeing a talk by Frank Stella at the Hood Museum back in 2009. It was, I was very inspired by his work and very inspired by his talk. And I just loved his shape paintings um, and how he wasn't confined to a, a rectangle. Um, and as I was working with wood, I, I, I thought to myself, well, why am I working with rectangles? I can make any shape I want. Um, so I took this board and I cut it up into three pieces. And um, so the, the inspiration was, the shape was inspired by Stella, although it's not a Stella shape. And then the painting, I, what I did is I painted it with uh, tinted shellac, all kinds of colors, but, but a lot of black, obviously. And in that respect, it was, I was sort of going with trying to see what would happen if I tried to create a Rothko, a black, a black Rothko painting. And um, so that's what I did. And um, it wasn't very good, I didn't think. It was just eh, not exciting. Um, I put it in storage. One of my problems with the original piece is these gaps were way too far. It was like a quarter inch gap instead. I, I brought it down to about an eighth of an inch, maybe less, a little less than an eighth. Um, but it was just, I don't know, just not very interesting. Um, and I pulled it out recently. Where's this? Um, pulled it out. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Sometime in the last year. And um, decided it needed some acrylic paint if I could, that I could, and I debated exactly what to do with it for a number of months, but uh, this is what I came up with. Um, and uh, I don't know what to say about that. Just that, yeah, it's the best I could do. So, oh, one of the things I like, one of the things I like to do, and one of the great things about working with shellac too, though, is that you could paint multiple colors and then rub them out and really get these interesting layers of colors, but also get, get the paint so thin that it, it's just, you can't get it this thin any other way. And then, so you get these interesting spots where it's wood mixing with paint. Um, and then you also get multiple colors coming through. So here's you know, this pink and orangish area. And this is a, a white and yellow area. The blue, what do I do with the blue? It's a blue and green, that's right. I, I did two layers of blue and green there. Um, so that's one of the things I like to do. I think I tried to put different areas where it was more rubbed out than other areas. So in this corner, there's a major rub out. And um, yeah, then I kept the live edge here on this one little spot. Oh, the other, other problem with this piece is it was upside down. I originally hung it the other way. And, and when I turned it this way, I realized that was the original way it was a bad, it was a horrible mistake. And this one is called Tuesday's Lunch. Um, and there's no really good reason for that other than I didn't really want to give it a title that meant anything. And it was just, it was Tuesday and I had just had lunch. So I was thinking of lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's, well, that's I didn't history. hear the beginning, so I don't know if we're supposed to chime in with questions. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Jody. You can interrupt. Yeah. Uh, is it hinged or is it, I mean, clearly the, the bottom part of it comes out forward from the, I'm talking about the lunch. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. This one, yeah, this yeah. one. So the um, base looks like it comes out from the wall. Oh, no, this one's completely flat. It is. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. But I like that optical illusion effect with the 
how it's painted. It works for me. Oh, good, good. Because <laughs> it looks like it's, uh, yeah, that's, that was my question. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So okay. It's very flat. Yep. Um, as you can see from the, the bevel on the top, it's a pretty thick piece of wood. It's like an inch and a quarter, I think, is what I found the final dimension. Well, that adds to the illusion, too, though. So uh -huh. it's kind of an angle on the top. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. And when you put the acrylic over the shellac, uh -huh. is it, um, does it bond well, or do you have to coat it with something else after, or? Um, I never worked. Yeah, with yeah, it bonds, it yeah. bonds, but um, the issue is if I start rubbing the, the acrylic paint or sanding the acrylic paint, mm -hmm. immediately it'll, it'll rub right off. So what I do is I add shellac on top of it and okay shellac gives it stability so it's shellac acrylic shellac got it right right and while i'm going working with a piece i'm continually rubbing and sanding and polishing and so i'm adding and taking away shellac at the same time mm -hmm. um but i but that's what allows you to get this really fine layer here that's yeah I love so that. thin you can see right through the, the yeah. acrylic in some places um but yeah it's shellac paint shellac. that's great thanks thank you thank you jody okay and then this piece was called always there and i had started it in 2012 um and it wasn't very good. I just didn't like it and didn't know what to do with it. Um, one of the problems was that these gaps, they had the same problem with the other, as the other piece I just showed you, that these gaps were too wide. Um, but the other, other issue was that the colors were sort of muddy. These, the shellac painting part was, was muddy. And I didn't, hadn't yet started painting with acrylic paints. I didn't really know anything about acrylic paints. I'd never bought an acrylic paint before. Um, and this is actually, I think the last of the series before I started playing with acrylics. So right after I did this, I started um, buying acrylic paints and painting, just playing around on plywood and experimenting with acrylic paint and shellac and seeing what it would do on plywood. And, um, Anyway, this piece was started in 2012. And when I was cleaning out my studio, I had to clean out my studio and rearrange some things in April of 2000, April, maybe it was, it was spring, summer of 2020. And this piece had been in my studio many years. I had put it in storage for a while and then brought it back because I thought I would rework it, but uh, it was, it was years and years in my studio. I had no idea what I was gonna do with it. And when I was cleaning out the studio, I, I literally held either held it over the garbage can or put it in the garbage can, I can't remember. But I, I pulled it out and said, okay, just one, one last chance, one last try. Let's, let's see if we can do something with it. So I, I thought about it for several more, month, several more months before I got to it. But um, I, I obviously tightened up the, the edges and added better coloring to it and debated what to do with the, the acrylic aspect to it. But um, this is what I came up with eventually. Because you needed, with something like this, it really needs to be somewhat minimal. You can't over, you, you really have to avoid overpainting the wood because the wood is a really important aspect of the piece. Um, and amazingly, it wasn't damaged very much being in my studio for so many years, I was really surprised. There were some scratches I cleaned up. In fact, this might have, this was an old scratch right here um, that I cleaned up. And you really can't tell from this picture. And part of, part of the problem is this is my own image. I, I you know, this is the one image that I took myself rather than having Rick do. But um, you can't tell. But these are wedges. This this goes this is a low part right here. It comes up high. These meet at the same point. It goes down. And it comes up and it goes back down. Um, and this looks like mostly, this is all curly maple, it looks like. 
it's all maple. Okay. And uh, yep, yeah, it's called Always There. I don't know. It was finished in 2020. Um, and then this last piece I show is called um, <laughs> Boring descriptive title of uh, double quadrilateral. Um, but I started in 2019 and I did start painting with the shellac. I did use the tinted shellac to create the, these colors and I, I, I painted acrylics over the uh, live edge right here on the edges, on the ends. But originally what I was going to do is have it as a lean piece, just leaning against the wall, sort of like a, a John McCracken painting. Um, but it, when I got to that point, it just, it just didn't feel right. I just didn't like it. It seemed a little too boring. And I thought it needed to be a wall piece, but I didn't know what to do with it. So it stayed in my studio for a couple of years before I got back to it. And um, again, added a minimalist painting to it. Uh, with the yellow and the green, and I'm not really sure. I think I looks like I painted a green underneath the yellow, and I, I'm pretty sure I painted blue underneath the green. I might let's, let's see. I think there was some blue showing somewhere in here. Um, and I, oh, here's a nice section where you could see I rubbed it really thin. Um, but yeah, just trying to add some dynamic to it, create a, a wide wall piece. This is uh, seven feet wide. No, seven inches, seven inches high. It's uh, 60, 68 inches wide. So six and a half feet or so. Um, yep. And then that's it. So these are essentially eight pieces that were created over 14 years. And um, that's why I called it Patience Perseverance because it took a long time. And uh, there you go. Let me stop, let me go stop the share now. Just, okay, there you go. Okay, there. <laughs> um, any questions? Any other? Things you want to see or talk about? That wasn't so painful, was it, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, surprisingly not. Yeah, anyway, because I didn't see anybody. I couldn't see anybody. I was just looking at the screen. Right, right. <laughs> um, I have a couple questions for you. Yep. Um, you know, it seems like you put a lot of, obviously, time uh, and care into each piece. Um, but then together as a group, they have their own personality. So like individually, like you said, they're alive um, and they definitely have their own personalities. But when they're together, it's like this, this larger dynamic, mm -hmm. I don't know, something. Um, did you specific, like how many pieces do you have in your studio that you choose from to group this personality together? Um. It just seems like they, you know, right. they communicate across. Right, right. Well, you know, you don't want to know how many pieces I have. <laughs> I actually have a studio sale this Sunday. I'm trying to get rid of some pieces. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I just took from the this last year and a half of okay. work. And there were a couple of pieces that didn't, just didn't make it because of the size of the space. Mm -hmm. There were a few pieces that I wanted to show, but it just wasn't enough space. and. I guess these were my favorites, although I hate to claim favorites, but well, I don't know. I thought they would show better, better in a space than, than some of the other ones that I didn't think. But there were at least I could think of at least three other pieces that didn't make the show. But the, yeah, I was trying to limit it just to this time period of work for the last year and a half. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I think one of the interesting things about about them is that there's a lot of variety in how they 
there's, there's just a lot of variation in styles because it's over so many years. Right. But then there's similarities too. Um, Makes sense. I don't know. But yeah, I, I like I like the fact that they 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 feel to me like they have personality. Uh, definitely. I, they definitely do. Yeah. I like I like I don't know. I, I I think the fact that they even hang off the wall so that they're in the space mm -hmm. just a little or a lot, depending on the piece, does that, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to read them oh, to you if that's okay. okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, are the colors generated in some way you can talk about? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can talk about that. Um, what I do is I, well, shellac comes in flakes. So you get shellac and you get denatured alcohol and you mix it together and the shellac dissolves in the denatured alcohol. So you have this liquid of shellac goo and then um, that's what I use for my clear shellac but I could add color and I use tints um, it's tinted shellac but I these these, these dyes these uh, wood finishing dyes that I use um, and I'll just have different containers of red yellow blue or black and um, so I'll just work from the, the primaries in black uh, but I'll brush it on with a an acrylic brush and but the problem is that you can't just brush it on and be done with it you it's a lot of working and reworking to get it to bleed out and make it look natural otherwise it looks like so splotch of color so there's a there's a, a lot there's a and depending how how poorly you do it it, it, could, it could really but anyway it, it it's it's a a process of getting the colors to bleed out once they're painted on. And uh, I'll do some sanding, but mostly it's rubbing with those tinted, sh tinted colors. And um, oh, the other thing, yeah, the wood is sealed with shellac. So the color is actually floating mm. above the wood. It's not a dye. It's not going into the wood for the most part. There's some that, that get into the wood, but mostly it's floating. So that allows it to be worked and reworked. And that's one of the features of shellac that it's, it's not a it's not, it's a finish, but it's not finished. It's, it's, it's workable. It's, it's malleable over time because it dissolves in, in detent in alcohol. So you could continue to rework it even after it's on the wood. Um, here's a, it's a note and a question from Precha. Precha is an artist from Thailand. He uses uh, wood in his work. Um, from old houses and the content is about the poor and the slums and the homeless. Um, he says, your work is very interesting. I like the wood materials you use. Uh, you create geometric shapes combined with painting. It's something new and interesting. And his question is, what, are, what is your creative inspiration? Hmm, what is my creative inspiration? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> mostly, I don't know, mostly it, it you know, it's just, you, I look at work and I like work sometimes. I don't like work sometimes. Um, so it all gets mixed in there. Um, it's also an evolution of work. You know, what I'm, I'm experimenting all the time. Every piece is an experiment. And so it's an evolution of experimentation. Um, it's also a process of trying to figure out what works with the materials I want to work with. So if I'm working with wood, you know, I don't want to just, I want to have a, a way for you to admire the wood itself without it being overwhelmed by work, reworking or carving or something else. So I'm, I'm trying to minimize the overlay on the wood. Um, so it's, it's a mix of a lot of different things, but, but yeah, part of, part of the inspiration is, is, is just finding what works with what you want to work with. And well, what am I, I guess that, that brings up a whole nother topic of why I want to work with wood or shellac or, um, or to plywood or whatever. I don't know, but, um, I, I like the individuality of wood 
And I like the, a lot of the work is inspired by just, uh, it's, you know, the individuality of the piece, trying to create something that's unique, unique um, form, unique shape, unique colorings, the, the, the design underneath the painting is completely, you know, it, it's like we're all unique beings. That's, that's sort of how the whole being thing comes to be. That they, that they sort of have a life of their own because they're very, in, very unique and individualistic. Um, and that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. That's a lot of it too. It's just so creating like, something that's- A bit yeah. like Frankenstein's. You're creating <laughs> your own. Yes. Yes, I'm creating Frankenstein's, <laughs> and they're gonna they're gonna attack me one night. I'm sure. Well, I'd be careful. <laughs> no, <laughs> I sleep with an eye open. Yeah. So anyway, hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Yeah, Thank you. And, uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Um, feel free to write in the chat. That was those are the two. Or if you have something okay. you want to yell out loud, feel free. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, let's see what if I um, anything else to tell you about the work. <laughs> I'll chip, chime in. Um, Rob, one of the yeah. things I'm very interested in is organic and natural forms juxtaposed with man made and uh, geometric forms. And mm -hmm. materials too, natural materials with things like steel, industrial materials. Um, and I find, I haven't really seen this work with the acrylic geometry on top of the stain before, I don't think, before this show. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting. I really- oh, thank you. Thank like you, Jody. doing with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the first piece that had the patterning and the other almost drawing under the stripes was really interesting too, uh, the layering. But mm -hmm. they say the, um, well, all the pieces really where you take off from the figure of the wood and add the geometry and it bounces off of it, I think is really, uh, it's interesting to me. It's yeah. really uh, fun to see. I'm gonna get over to Johnson and see, I hope. Oh, oh good. Good. I'm glad, I hope you get to see it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, that that aspect I think is pretty unique, and that I haven't seen it anywhere else either. So I think. I, I think I like how it also it reads right away until you look at it. It doesn't read as acrylic, you know. I think uh -huh. it reads because of the shellac and because it's floating on top of the shellac. It's almost like it looks like you're playing with analog and digital but nothing's actually digital about it, but it looks like that because the colors you're using and the mm -hmm. floating on top, almost like a neon or something mm -hmm. like that. So I mm -hmm. think I think that's what makes it so like, wait a second, what is this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Which is great. It's great to see something like Preacher and Jody just said, something kind of new, not new material, but putting them together in a way that we haven't quite seen before. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I often look at the acrylic part of it and, and think it looks like a decal. It's yeah, yeah. Like, like pasted right. a decal on top of. Mm -hmm. I wish it were that simple. <laughs> well, you could get vinyl printed and do it, but I think the yeah, paint allows maybe, you more yeah, control. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, it just, working with the shellac and the acrylic gives you an opportunity to create, do things or just, you know, there's interest. I think they're interesting in getting those layers. I love, I love depth on a flat surface, creating depth in a flat surface. And the, and the shellac, the, the, the French polish technique with shellac is, is really great for that. But there's the added layers of the paint as well, which creates another layer of depth. But when you get up to it, you can see it's, it's completely flat. But, um, but it's not, but it, I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's, and um, well, the other thing that I really love about shellac and the French polish technique is that it's, it magnifies everything so 
immensely. I mean, you could just, if you get to the, if you look at the edge of them, you could just see these fine undulations in the, the surface of the wood that you wouldn't see any other way. You have to really be in the presence and really look at the, on the edge and, and just go back and forth. But it's, it just really magnifies everything. So they have to be, the surface that really has to be perfect. And that's what, what's really time consuming about it is, is getting it to be so far. Well, that's, that's crazy. Why did I do that? I don't know. <laughs> Just thinking about it. Why, why would I do that? <laughs> you rub it. Oh, I'm muted between. Do you rub it with a cloth and rubbing alcohol? Is that how you polish it? Uh, well, it's it's a denatured alcohol, really good grade denatured alcohol. But yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you take a ball of cotton, not, not cotton. Well, what I use, I use the, the, the packing, the, the stuff that Clothes making, you know, people making clothes, they have cotton that they stuff into things, like pillows, I guess. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and um, it's called something. I don't know. Bad. And I take a, an old, I take a, like a old sheet, old cotton sheet, it has to be cotton and it has to be at least 400 um, thread count. stitches per inch. What do they call it? The thread count. Thread, thread count has to be 400, and at least 400 or more. And then you just you take the cloth over the, the cotton and you you rub it. But yeah, I'll add I'll pour the shellac onto the cotton ball or add alcohol onto that as well. I use different different um, solutions of of shellac as well. Sometimes it's very thin, sometimes it's thick, depending on what I'm doing. But yeah, it's all poured onto the wood, the cloth, and you rub it back and forth over and over. Very tactile. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, Jimmy, I am a patient. Um, why you make um, you use uh, geometric form and contact uh, a free form in uh, nature? You make uh, a color on the woods, you know, and lie and uh, chair, uh, chair of work in uh, geometric form. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. geometric form? Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've, you know, like with those first two pieces, you saw that, that they're, they're shaped, they're odd shaped, they're not geometric. When, when I first started working with this technique, I was, following the grain, the pattern of the grain and creating pieces that were, you know, cut according to the grain pattern. Um, but uh, yeah, and by 2000, those, those pieces I showed you are the last two, last of those ser that series that I did. And then after that, I started joining the boards together and, and working more geometrically. Um, why the switch? Well, for one thing, I, I just, I felt it was too formulaic to continue following the grain pattern and staying with the grain pattern. And I wanted to uh, do minimalistic. I wanted it to, I wanted the wood, I wanted some kind of minimalistic geometric work. That was, I, I thought it would work better with the, the grain as well. I didn't, I didn't want it, I didn't want something a bit overpowering the, the wood itself. So I guess in that way, you know, the, with the cutting along the grain and, and shaping it that way emphasizes the grain pattern, but by using the geometric shapes, I'm at least not taking away from the grain. It's, you can still see it. So that, I hope that, does that answer your question? Does that make sense? I like it. I like you use. I like you make uh, wood, material wood, and uh, material wood, own wood, and uh, you paint uh, painting on the wood. Uh, is uh, I think interesting. You know. You Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I did uh, some something. I I I was. Uh, 
technique uh, was on was me works and i i i i use uh, uh, the woods i use a woods and and, and make a structure house you know mm -hmm. yeah you you use uh, you use the uh, material woods uh, own wood and you make shape uh, geometric i like this and uh, you make with uh, a color you know and color and beautiful color in the line on the wood yes okay well, thank, thank you thank you for joining and thank you for your questions I think a couple of people came in a little bit later. Is uh -huh. there any way you'd want to, before we close out, just screen share one more time and kind of flip okay. through your show really quick? Yeah, sure. Because I think um, maybe yeah. some people are like, hmm, what are they talking about? <laughs> right, oh, here it is, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, here, yeah. So yeah. this is the, the show in the Red Mill Gallery. Um, what do I do? Am I doing this wrong? No, you got it. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Oh, and how do I? Uh, if you make it full screen, it might give you yeah. those arrows. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, where are my arrows? Okay. Mm hmm. I don't have arrows. Maybe they may be uh, hiding behind the uh, faces. Oh. Yeah. Maybe I did something wrong. We're sharing screen. Oh, here. Okay. Okay, that worked. Okay. okay. There you go. Um, yeah, so we'll just wander through the gallery here. And, uh, these are the tip tick. You know, this piece, those, uh, I can't go back, but um, these two pieces, I, I took a long time to decide whether they were individual or whether it was a dip tick. And I decided they really needed to be together. And I, I thought they'd be lonely if they were, if they were separated. So I said they, they need to be sold together. Um, and then, yeah, there you go. It's, um, on Butternut, there's the fourth iteration of that painting. Um, this is a flame birch, and acrylic, and shellac. This is this is a quilted maple. It's, it's a really intense figure in that maple on that one. It's hard to see with the I guess I overpowered it, powered it with a tint of shellac on that one. Yeah. So there you go. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Rob. That was excellent. Thanks okay. for thank you, Kristen, putting yourself out there. Uh, I really appreciate you giving me the chance. Yeah, definitely. Good, and the show experience. was up um, in Johnson, Vermont, the Red Mill Gallery at Vermont Studio Center um, until August thirteenth. So definitely come by, check it out if you're not in Thailand. <laughs> if you are, <laughs> maybe in Vermont, um, right. you can come see it. Um, just email galleries at vermontstudiocenter.org and you can just say, I'm going to be in town on Monday, the blah, blah, blah. Can I come in at this time? And we'll just make sure the door is unlocked. So, yep. Thank you, Doug. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so see much. You, and Rob, when this is done, when I edit this, I'll send a version of it to you so you can see what you think. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Really right. interesting. Thank you. Great seeing you all.